The last thing I remember, I was working the night shift when someone came in for a case of beer. He was a tall and rather lanky white guy with tattoos covering every inch of his exposed skin. As he wandered around the store, I noticed he kept glancing my way with a nervous look. After about five minutes, he approached the register, placing the case of beer on the counter and staring down at the register. Afraid to ask the guy for his ID and assuming he was well over 21, I put a date on the machine to approve the sale and glanced back at the man just as he pulled a gun out of the waist of his jeans. He ordered me to open the register and give him all the cash and he was looking back and forth between me and the gas pumps as if expecting to see someone out there. I opened the drawer and began pulling everything out, my hands shaking so much I could barely hold it all. As I handed the cash across the counter, he looked back outside once again and panicked at the sight of a police patrol car pulling up to the pumps. Time itself seemed to slow to a crawl as he looked back at me, a scowl covering his face. He thought I had somehow alerted the police. Before I could tell him it wasn't me, that Officer Johnson came in here every night at this time, a loud popping noise stopped everything. I felt myself fall into the floor, but there was no pain. I must have just had an anxiety attack and collapsed at the sight of the gun. If I just breathed calmly, all would be better in a few short minutes. The last thing I saw before closing my eyes was Officer Johnson's face as he came to check on me as I drifted off to sleep. When I awoke, I could tell something wasn't right. I could hear people talking, but I couldn't move or open my eyes. It sounded like my wife's voice speaking to someone, discussing something that sounded serious, but I couldn't quite make out what they were saying. Then I heard her as she spoke to me directly. She said she loved me and would miss me. I wanted to say something back, to ask what was happening, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't even open my eyes. Then I heard a loud, long beep, and the room went silent. I thought that was it until I heard my wife sobbing. Then the voice of a man saying the time of death was 11.23 p.m. There was some shuffling around, and more than ever I was screaming inside. Why couldn't they hear me? They had to know I was still here. Then the sobbing voices faded. I heard a door close, and the room was completely silent once again. I have no idea how long I laid there. The silence was unbearable, and there was no light. Eventually, the door would open again, followed by footsteps and the sound of wheels. I could tell from the sound that I had been moved into another bed and was being wheeled somewhere. I couldn't feel anything. I could only guess, based on what I knew of hospitals, that I was being taken to the morgue. But I wasn't dead. How could this be happening? The sound of wheels stopped after a few minutes. There was an elevator and several doors before we finally reached the destination. Whoever had been pushing me walked away, and the last sound I heard for a while was the light switch flipping and a door being locked. When I did hear the door again, I assumed they had finally come for me. Maybe they would find a heartbeat. Classical music began playing, somewhat drowning out the sound of sawing noises that told me they were most likely performing an autopsy. I still couldn't feel anything, and for the first time, I was truly thankful for that. Focusing on the music, I tried to pretend I was anywhere other than a cold slab in the morgue being cut open. The coroner spoke to me as he worked, almost as if we were good friends. He talked about how sad it was that this had happened to me, and how he would make sure the evidence would go toward locking the man up for life. He mentioned that he had found something, which I assumed was the bullet when I heard the sound of metal clinking a few feet away. I had seen enough TV shows to imagine the process taking place. He was completing his inspection of my insides, documenting everything. When he finished up, he would work as a grotesque seamstress to put me back together. It was easy to imagine it happening to someone else, almost as if it wasn't real. When he was done, the music stopped, and I heard him say goodnight before leaving once more. It would be what I imagined was several hours before I would hear the door open again. This time, there were two men, discussing some kind of paperwork. As soon as one of the men was satisfied that everything was signed, I heard the sound of my body being moved again to a different bed and wheeled out of the room. The sound of a door slamming on what I assume was a hearse told me we were going somewhere new. The engine starting gave me a sinking feeling. 
I knew what the next step would be, and I wasn't ready. The ride felt a lot longer than I thought it would be. I wasn't sure which funeral home they were taking me to, but I did know what awaited me there. I heard the vehicle shut off and a door open, then close. Another door opened, this time closer, and I heard what had to be the stretcher I was on being moved. Then a voice not too far away asked whether that one was to be fixed up or burned. The man who had brought me in said there was going to be an open casket ceremony, followed by a cremation. The next several hours were filled with what I assume was preparation for the funeral. I don't know everything that happened, but I think they dressed and washed me, finally moving me to a coffin and wheeling me into a very quiet room. I knew it was probably a lot like the rooms that I had been in for other people's funerals over the years, mostly due to the deafening silence. I laid there for hours, what I imagined was overnight, as I awaited the funeral. For everything I had been through, this was probably the worst experience to that point. There's something about the lack of noise in a funeral home that always made my skin crawl. People could be crying their eyes out, and yet the silence still prevailed. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, I heard a door open. I could tell people were moving around, though who was there and what they were doing was lost on my ears. Then, I heard sobbing as someone approached me. My wife stood there, crying for an eternity, as I lay helplessly listening. She must have leaned in close, because I heard her whisper that she loved me, and that she would see me again someday. Then, I felt a teardrop land on my forehead. For the first time in days, I could feel. The cool air on my skin and the wake of her tear rolling down my head was both refreshing and terrifying. I needed to get a message to her, to tell her, I'm still here. To let her know that I wasn't going anywhere. I tried with all of my strength. Nothing happened. I couldn't move or speak or yell. I heard her walking away, her sobs fading as she moved. The hours crept by, with more people filing in to pay their respects. I heard the voice of my brother, promising to look out for the kids. My father telling me he was supposed to be the one being buried before me. As more and more people moved through, it was like living my life in fast forward. I never expected so many people to show up to my funeral. When the time for eulogies came, I heard familiar voices telling stories about my childhood and trouble I had gotten in and somehow escaped. For a brief moment, it all seemed so peaceful. Then it was over. The crowd left, my wife being the last to say one more time that she loved me, and the room was silent again. It wasn't long before I heard what I only assumed to be the funeral director cleaning up things around the area where I laid. The sound of the casket being moved was unmistakable this time, and I knew where they were taking me. The furnace room had an odd sound to it. Gas flowing through the pipes and pilot lights firing brought on a feeling of dread. I felt my body being lifted out of the casket and laid on a table. Then the realization hit me. When I decided to be cremated, I always assumed I would be completely dead and gone. My spirit, if I had one, would be wherever spirits go when the body stops working and I wouldn't be aware of what was happening. As I heard the shelf I was on being rolled into the oven and the door closing, I was screaming as loud as I could inside my head. The sound of the gas flowing was followed by the clicking of an igniter and finally the whoosh of flame as it engulfed me.